I'm Anna Louise from Minerva and I'm here today to sew along with you this beautiful Butterick 4669 bodice pattern to fill all your cosplay, dress up and cottage core vibe dreams. This pattern is an excellent make for an adventurous beginner. It's also a really good base pattern. Like a recipe for a sponge cake, it's an excellent base, but it makes it so much more exciting when you add a personal touch and chocolate. This is also a really good make if you want to branch out into corsetry. This lined close fitted bodice has several different variations so you can really make it your own. Option A is the simplest make, option B which is the one we are sewing today features an all round peplum, option C has a pleated back peplum and option D has really let loose with the lacing variations. There are several fabric options we can use for this pattern, but as it's such a close fitting garment, it's a good idea to stick to fabric with little to no stretch on the bias or anywhere. The packet recommends silk broadcloth, damask, linen, tapestry and brocade. On this pattern, we would normally make bias binding out of the lining fabric. However, as we are using Cotil, which is famous for having very little to no stretch, we will have to improvise. So for a fun added detail, I'm using some rather special bias binding available on Minerva. Then we will be making some bias binding for the hem of our peplum. If you're using a lighter fabric, such as the linen or a silk broadcloth, it is recommended that you use a heavyweight sewing interfacing, such as the one tagged below. But again, our cotil is providing so much of the structure, we don't need to add anything else. Of course, everything we talk about today is available on Minerva right now and will be linked down below and will pop up throughout the video for your ease of shopping. First things first, we need to have what I call a safety chat. This is all information you can find on the pattern instructions. We are going to be back stitching the beginning and end of our stitch lines and pressing seams open. There's a variation in the seam allowance throughout the pattern, so keep an eye out. Without further ado, let's get stitching. For this make, we are using this Minerva Core Range Rose Pink 100% Cotton Cloner fabric. This fabric is absolutely perfect for this pattern. Although originally more popular for a quilting and patchwork fabric, it is now really popular for dressmaking. It's sturdier than your normal poplin, but lighter than a cotton drill. It's machine washable and breathable, perfect for a close fitting garment such as this one. It has a fantastic depth of colour. It looks like this rose pink fabric was freshly picked from a cottage garden. For our lining, we are using this beige herringbone cotil. This hard wearing and movable fabric is mostly used for corset making. The herringbone pattern is actually really handy for helping to line up your fabric pieces with the straight of the grain. Both the fabrics we are using today take chalk really well. As they are both cotton and both very stable, it's as easy as drawing on paper. As both of these fabrics have oodles of structure, it's a good idea to either steam them to death on the ironing board or iron them while they're still damp from the washing machine. Last but not least, we will need our notions. They are some gold eyelets and some beautiful ribbon. These are our bodice top pieces. They are centre back, side and centre front. Our first job is going to be running some easing stitches onto the centre front pieces between the marks. This is going to help us ease them into the princess seams. Now we have our easing stitches in place, with the right sides together we are going to line up our top and bottom side and centre front pieces, matching the notches, filling on the stitches to ease in the fullness. As you can see by my instruction checking, I was a little bit concerned by the amount of spare fabric left at the top of my princess seam, but after laying the piece out flat I saw it tucked in and became part of the armhole. Once we have our princess seam pinned securely, we can start sewing with a 1.5cm seam allowance. We repeat this step on our lining and main fashion fabric. Thank you. 
Once those seams are sewn, we are clipping them and pressing them open. This is where I added a little extra flare and top stitched some gold thread over the top of the seam allowance. One, to keep it flat and tidy, and two, because it was shiny, and matched the also shiny gold eyelets. And then, for even more shine, I'm using some excellent metallic gold bias binding to bring it all together. Now we have added some fun decoration to our princess seams, we're going to sew right sides together our shoulder seams on our lining and our main fashion fabric, using a 1.5cm seam allowance. Now our shoulder seams are pressed open, with wrong sides together we are going to baste our lining and fashion fabric layers together, so as the Spice Girls said, to become one. Plot twist. Before I baste my two layers together, I'm adding in two boning channels to both sides of the front of the bodice. This is to keep the front edges smooth and provides more support. This isn't necessary, this is just something I wanted to add to make it a little more old timey. About one centimetre in from the centre front, to leave room for the bias binding, I'm going to pop in a teeny tiny boning channel using my gold decorative thread. And then I will leave a 1cm gap for the eyelets, then add in another boning channel. This is something you see quite commonly in historical garments. It gives extra support to the eyelets and takes some strain off of them. If you are not feeling ready to invest in some boning, why not have a rummage in the garage or in that drawer that everyone abandons things in and see if you can find some zip ties. They have the same structure and rigidness needed to add some extra support. It wouldn't be too difficult to fully bone this bodice either if you wanted to carry on a hack. Once the boning sections are in place, I'm going to baste all around the raw edges, leaving the boning channels open at both ends. This type of lace-up bodice reminds me of a garment from the Middle Ages called a kirtle. This type of lace-up garment was typically used over a chemise or slip to provide a smooth silhouette. More wealthy women had button-down kirtles that were worn over their clothes. However, your more working class women would have had a lace-up kirtle under their clothes. No need to spend money on costly buttons when no one would see them. A kirtle didn't just make up a bodice. A skirt was often pleated or gathered into the waistband to make a dress, similar to the one seen in this picture from the early 1600s. Also, adding a skirt to the bodice would make a really fantastic hack for this pattern. Now our bodice is coming together nicely, we're going to start work on our peplum. With right sides together, we're going to match up our side seam notches and sew with a 1.5cm seam allowance. We repeat this step on our lining fabric and press those seams open. Now our little peplum break is over, we can start with the bias binding. We start by bias binding the armhole. With right sides together, we start by lining up the raw edges of the binding and armhole. We place the binding on the wrong side of the garment so it will fold over and cover the stitching that holds it in place on the right side of the garment. I find binding is a little bit like putting in an invisible zip. It's one of those things you stare at for two minutes each time you do it thinking, how do I do this again? We work the bias binding round the armhole. We're going to stop one inch before the marked large dot on the centre back piece. We want to leave enough bias binding free to finish the back seam. We then sew the bias binding in the folded groove so it is easier to fold over. Thank you. 
After the bias binding is sewn to the wrong side, we press the bias binding out towards the right side and pin it to the right side of the garment, covering over our basting and bias binding stitches. Try and match the thread to the bias binding, or don't if you want a fun contrast. I'm very impressed that my machine is tolerating this gold thread, she's doing a great job. We're going to stop the top stitching of the bias binding 2 inches from the large marked dot on the centre back panel. Then to finish the back of the garment, we are going to bring the side and back seams wrong sides together. We're going to pin it from the large marked dot and we're going to baste a 1cm seam. Once that basting seam is sewn, we're going to press the finished seam towards the centre front and slip the side of the bias binding underneath it. This is also going to secure our basted seam. Then sew that in place. I used a zigzag stitch just to ensure I was catching all the edges I needed to because we are now working with several layers of fabric. Once the lower edge of the bias binding is attached, we're going to press the remaining bias binding over the top of that seam and sew in place. If you would like some more inspiration, we have some wonderful makes in the Cotille to start your corset journey. The wonderful maker, Sarita Brianna, made these stunning Regency era stays, and the fabulous Liz Von Villers made this colourful and creative pair of 17th century stays. Have you ever made anything with Catil? Please share your make on Minerva, it really helps to encourage others. And now our back is finished and looking lovely and neat. No more edges here! I just want to take a quick break here at the halfway mark to talk about our wonderful community here at Minerva. We really want to encourage everyone to take up something crafty. At the top right of the post, you will be able to follow Minerva and keep up to date with offers, new releases, general fabric prettiness, and of course, tutorials, sew alongs, and top pattern picks. Let us know what you would like to see next. Comment below, we'd love to hear what you think. We are going to take another little break from our bodice to make some bias binding for the hem of our peplum. Here I am using just the section of the bias binding pattern we are given, as I don't need a huge amount. I'm just lining up the edge of the pattern piece with the selvage edge of the fabric. This ensures I cut on the bias. I'm cutting about four of these pieces from the main fashion fabric. Catil is so stiff it would make really poor bias binding. Once I've cut out my bias pieces, I'm sewing them right sides together with a 1cm seam allowance. By sewing them at a right angle, I ensure I create one straight continuous piece of binding. Thank you. 
We then press the bias binding seam open and get out our extremely handy bias binding maker. This is a really handy little tool that makes making bias binding so much easier. By pulling the fabric through, it folds as we go, meaning all we need to do is press and do not need to do any fiddly folding or measuring. Now on the peplum lining, we are going to do a straight stitch one centimeter from the upper raw edge. This is going to help us get an accurate seam allowance further down the line. Once that marking stitch is done, we are going to clip that curved edge and then press the 1cm seam allowance that we've created down on the wrong side of our garment. Once the lining is pressed, we're going to baste the two peplum pieces with wrong sides together, matching the lower edges, leaving a 1cm gap between the start of the top of the lining and the top of the fashion fabric. Once our peplum pieces are basted together, we can attach our very own handmade bias binding. I was thinking that handmade binding would make an excellent gift for your crafty friends and family. I think I would pass out with happiness if someone gave me that. That's not a hint by the way, what I really want is a pony. We apply the bias binding to the hem of our peplum in the same way we applied it to the armhole. First by sewing it right to wrong side, then folding over, pressing and then top stitching. Before we attach our peplum to our bodice, I'm going to add some boning. This is something you want to leave as late as possible because once they go in, the garment becomes very tricky to work with. Here I have some 8mm feather light boning. Now we bring our two pieces together, right sides together. We're matching our marked square on the bodice side with our peplum side seam. We will be using a 1cm seam allowance when sewing. Make sure to keep the lining free of the waist stitch line. We then clip the fashion fabric seam allowance and press the seam towards the hem of the peplum. Now the fashion fabric is secured, you can slip stitch the lining to the bodice lining, or you can add a decorative top stitch to the waistline, making sure to secure the lining underneath. Once that is complete, we are going to bias bind the remaining raw edges. It's coming together nicely, there is just a little bit of hand sewing to do to finish off the untidy bias binding ends. It is now time for our eyelets. We will need a hammer, something that won't stain to mark our fabric with, and all eyelets and an uncarpeted, undamageable surface. First things first, I'm going to mark out the eyelet placement from the pattern piece just by lining up the edges and poking holes through. We then poke hole holes through the fabric with our awl. Using an awl for eyelets makes them more hard wearing because it doesn't actually cut or tear the fibres, meaning the fabric stays intact and can be put under more pressure without risk of ripping. Then, from the right side of the fabric, we push the eyelet through to the back, 
Then, using the tool included in the eyelet pack, we hammer the back down of the eyelet, securing it in place. And that is how I ended up with a hole in my lino. So after finding a cutting board and gluing the little circle of lino back in place, we carry on down the centre front. Eyelets weren't always made from metal, they were often hand sewn to create a polished finish, which is great for this project if you are unsure about investing in the hardware. Hand sewn eyelets are also good for other things aside from historical makes, such as finishing a drawstring. Grommets, or metal eyelets as we know them today, are a relatively modern invention. When I say modern, I mean around the 1820s, so not that modern. They were generally not meant to be seen, generally used on corsets or shoes. As the silhouette changed during the 19th century to a more hourglass shape, the metal eyelet became popular as it could take more strain from the lacing, meaning you could have a very distinct shape. If you're unsure on how to do eyelets, please do a practice one, using scraps of material left over from your project. Just make sure to practice on the same level of thickness that you're going to use at the end. And now all we have to do is lace her up and she is done. This bodice is such a great addition to any wardrobe. It's such a great layering piece that will work really well to add to jeans and a blouse for a casual drink with friends or to make a dress extra special. I also have some ideas for cosplay projects that would work quite well. An awful lot of princesses have this kind of lace-up bodice. I wasn't sure whether I liked the colour palette until I put it on. The pink and gold gives me so many different vibes. I'm thinking ABBA, Barbie, and then like really colourful armour? Anyway, now I'm in love with it. I will definitely be making more versions. Here at Minerva, we love to hear your views. What would you like to make with this fabric? What fabric would you use for the butterick pattern? Any questions, comment below and we'd be happy to answer them. And don't forget, Minerva Craft Club members get a 10% discount for 12 months when they sign up. And creating a free account, you'll get a welcome present of a discount coupon. So join us with our lovely community of makers, follow, comment and like, and we'll see you next time.